So first, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Harrell Biard is the Global Senior Managing Director of Accenture Labs, the company's dedicated R&D organization. In his role, he also directs Accenture's annual technology vision research, which looks at the future of enterprise technology. Mark has been with Accenture for nearly 20 years and has worked across all the five industries Accenture serves. Before taking on leadership of technology R&D, Mark was the global lead for emerging technology in Accenture. He is also one of a select group of Accenture certified master technology architects and is also a solution architect and select quality assurance director. Mark has broad software engineering and delivery experience, particularly in areas such as component and object oriented technologies. It is also my pleasure to introduce Shreyas Ramesh, the director of applied intelligence, quantum delivery in the North American quantum computing group in Accenture Digital. Shreyas has years of experience designing and developing applied quantum applications focused on delivering near-term business value. Some of the sample applications he's been involved with include financial services, portfolio optimization and risk analysis, and supply chain optimization. Finally, uh, after the presentation for Accenture, we'll bring Jen Houston on the line for a conversation. She's a senior vice president of marketing at D-Wave with nearly 20 years of marketing and communications experience in the technology and software industries. Before joining D-Wave, Houston was vice president of marketing at Aptio and a member of the senior leadership team who led the company to its IPO in 2016. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mark to get us started with the webinar. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm very happy to be here. And thanks for the invitation. We're thrilled to be here. And I'm calling from France, so it's, uh, it's a bit dark right now. I'm inside of France. But uh, I want to get started with uh, uh, the next slide and go to the agenda that we want to cover with you guys today. And so it will be like three sections in this presentation. The first one, I want to talk about the Accenture quantum uh, computing programs, when we started it, uh, what's the capability we have, and, and how we deliver that to our clients. And then uh, I will hand over to my friend Shreyas, who will talk about uh, some work we've been doing on Kignet Exchange. It's a very exciting uh, program that we've been launching uh, a few, few months ago, I would say. And then after that, there will be uh, a Q&A sessions that will, be, uh, that will be controlled and guided by Jen. And I think we'll, uh, we'll take some more questions after that also. Okay? So I suggest that we go to the next slide. And this is kind of a, a big picture of what is Accenture uh, doing in uh, quantum computing. So quantum computing, we started quantum computing practice in our labs um, three years ago. And in fact, to be very honest with you, um, I, um, I was not anticipating that we would go that fast in uh, delivering some, uh, some tangible results to our clients. Uh, my first visit was in D-Waves, in fact, and there's a nice picture that has been taken with uh, the CTO, Paul Doherty, of our company and myself in the refrigerating uh, tower. It looks like really fun. Uh, but uh, from then, I think we grew uh, very quickly because the, the really focus that Accenture is giving on, uh, on quantum computing today is really applied quantum computing. Um, I run the labs, we do apply R&D, means that every R&D research that we're doing needs to lead to tangible business results or something that will make a better world. And we'll talk about this. So if you think about uh, where we are uh, today, we, uh, we're innovating with our clients. We have a quantum zone and we have a, um, an innovation center in Detroit that specializes in quantum computing. We have also in our labs, uh, we have two labs covering quantum, one in um, San Francisco and we have another one in Sofia Antipolis where I live. Uh, the one in Sofia is more uh, dedicated to communication, quantum communication. Uh, and then from there, we have started to train people. Uh, so we have more than 100 contributors around the globe. As you can see, because it's very applied, we've been working on use cases and we've been uh, identifying more than 150 use cases across all the industry groups that we serve. We have some patents as well. And then we have some functional cross industries uh, from you know, portfolio management, risk management, and all those different things where we can, we can apply quantum. So we're very excited about it. But I think if you want to remember one thing from this slide is that it's apply quantum. That is our business. Maybe next slide. So if you look at um, quantum at scale, which I think is very important, and that's what our clients are looking at, is that what we see here is that uh, we are looking at the quantum solution as a complete use. Stack. That's what I have here. 
and then you could look at what type of talents you need uh, for building up your solutions. And we can start from the bottom where you see that this is where we're working with a quantum um, info scientist. This is where we connect with our friends from the waves. I'll come back to that because we also work with other um, uh, companies that are building quantum computers. It's Accenture is a very vendor agnostic company. So we serve our clients the best way possible, looking at different type of hardware solutions. And so you see that we work with D-Wave, but we also work with Regative, we work with IBM, um, and, and we have also classical computer alternatives like Microsoft. Now on top of that, what we're very interested in, obviously, is to work with uh, the, the companies that are building the software development kits. So sometimes uh, the SDK is com coming from the companies building the hardware. Uh, sometimes other companies are, are helping them out. Uh, and they're building the abstraction layer on top of, of the hardware. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, I want to mention through one qubit. Uh, we've made some um, partnership uh, and investment in one qubit. And uh, the good things about it is that it helps us also to program different uh, hardware uh, and, and be completely agnostic vis-a-vis -vis of this hardware. So one pro programs that we develop on one qubit could be deployed on different type of hardware. And on top of that, you go to, uh, to backend services that eventually will orchestrate the different APIs that we call, we're calling. Uh, APIs are mostly uh, built in Python and C, but uh, in, the, in the case that, uh, of the, uh, the example we're going to show you, uh, we've been using a backend service uh, built in Node.js. And, and then that's where you start working with um, uh, the system architect and so forth. And at the end, obviously, you have the front end. Here we use a React, uh, but you could use Angular, and then that's where basically you have all the you guys, guys, the service designer, and so forth. This is the stack, and this is where we work. Obviously, we spend most of our time on uh, on the uh, red, green, and blue, uh, and then we understand. I mean, we spend a lot of time with our comp uh, with our, our, our partners, the Waves, IBM, Brigitte, and everything, to understand exactly how we can leverage our hardware the best way possible. Next slide. Okay, so going back to what I just said to you, I think the visions that we have related to quantum computing is in an ideal world, um, I would love to see that any problems of this world, whether it's a business problem or it's changing the world, uh, you know, like how we fight against hunger, against many um, issues that we have in this world, is that we take these problems and we try to map them to some classifications, whether it's we talk about optimization problems, whether it's sampling problems, whether it's a machine learning problems, with the matchmaking stuff, I mean, different type of classifications. And I think what would be really cool is that for each of those classifications that we can connect that to a set of mathematical primitives, okay, or APIs that have been developed by um, the software company that are running on top of those hardware. And last, uh, the next step for us is that to look at, okay, out of those mapping that we have through this uh, uh, mathematical um, uh, procedure, you know, our primitive, is that which one is running the best one on which hardware? Because at the end, we want to serve the client the best way as possible. So again, this is what we, we would love to look at. And this is something that we are uh, working on. Okay, next slide. So next slide is, um, we're going to move to a kidney exchange. I'm going to hand over to my friend, Shrey Reis. But before going to this, I want to talk to you about something that is very important for our labs, and I think it's very important for Accenture overall, is that with all the power that's coming up with all this technology, and talking about quantum, but you could talk about AI, you could talk about other stuff, uh, comes a lot of responsibility as well. And uh, one thing that we've developed in our labs is, is trying to build also research and development, not only for our clients, but working with NGOs. Again, what I said is like building a better world. And so what we've done is that we've started to map uh, some of the technology that we're using and research agenda on the sustainable development goals of UNESCO. And we've started to embrace uh, some of, of, of those goals and to see what we could do about it. So we're going to talk to, and I'm going to hand over it now to Shreyas, and he's going to talk to you about this, uh, this kidney exchange problems that we're looking. I think it fits very, very well into, uh, into number three, probably, which is good health and well-being. And I believe that quantum will change the life of many people. Over to you, Shreyas. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mark and, and uh, Susan, for the great introductions that you provided us. What I'd like to talk to you about today is how we wound up building this kidney exchange problem. 
And, and what is the thinking that we went about getting this problem to come to reality? So very clearly what we're gonna show over here is, oops, is <clears throat> the kidney exchange problem over here being re reformulated as a psychomatic problem, which, which we know right now is to be an NP, NP complete problem and it's typically intractable on classical computers. Further, we demonstrate a mapping of this problem into a Cubo problem, which may be solved in here as the D-wave annealers, and you'll get to see that shortly. It's, it's interesting over here because the, the kidney transplant over here, it, it, it allows um, the patients with kidney diseases to replace their non-functional kidneys with healthy ones from either a living or a deceased donor. The best option for such patient is to receive a kidney from a living donor. In, and, and since in most countries, including the US, organ selling is prohibited and highly illegal, a living donor is usually someone who's close related in a relationship to the patient. Even a patient is, is able to find a donor willing to donate his or her kidney. It is often like the case that the kidney is just not compatible to the patient's body. And there would be an organ rejection leading to failure of transplant. The compatibility of the kidney can be tested and confirmed with certain level of confidence so just so you know, this is, this is where the patient donor mapping is found compatible. And that is where this kidney exchange comes in, where the frequent issue of incompatibility in, in, in kidney transplant by swapping kidneys between the group of patient donor pairs. So this is where we found a, the, the optimal match for this kidney exchange problem uh, through the cycle matching problem. Now, uh, the data that we wind up using uh, to protect a lot of the live patients through UNOS, et cetera, we had to randomly generate the data sets based on some statistical, based on a statistical model for the patient donor attributes. Uh, donor attributes such as zero mismatch, PRAs, uh, previously uh, donored, uh, previous, a recipient who was a previous donor, a recipient that's less than 18 years of age, uh, a donor and recipients are on the same state, et cetera. And, and this is what we wound up using to customize and, and create this unique implementation. Now, getting to this actual problem itself, we'd had to, uh, we'd essentially would challenge to model a kidney exchange framework into a directed graph. In, in, in here, basically, where you have each element in a vertex set that, that, that where, whereby uh, the patient's incompatibility is, is being mapped. And these, these elements in this edge sets is what's indicating the directional edge for any of these vertices that we have. So we wound up formulating this problem furthermore um, into, into a set of cycles that we could therefore create a, an optimization problem. And obviously these optimization problems have some very specific constraints on this one, which is where, uh, which is what we wound up developing and uh, hence, uh, for lack of better words, the secret sauce will be here. <laughs> Now, matching this Cubo problem into um, in, into a, into this uh, into what this industry problem that we are creating over here is, is what posed to be most of the challenges over here. So we had to finally formulate this problem from a mathematical standpoint into a Cubo standpoint. And once we built this capability, that's where uh, we had to present it right back into um, a, a directed graph, which allowed us to. Uh, to, to present it in what we're going to demonstrate shortly is the demo. So, you know, very clearly, as I mentioned before, this instant, uh, our model of the problem instances that we generated had various vertex attributes, attributes of the donor recipients that we had to build, uh, such as blood types, age, and previous donations, PRS, et cetera. Each one of these things were edge specific attributes um, whereby we, we, we build this, our, our own uh, edge scoring rubric. And that problem instance, as I mentioned before, is what we um, mapped the constraint problem into a directed graph for a cubo problem over here. Now, once we had that, uh, here's where we'd have to then, the great benefit of, of using uh, the D-Wave's QB solve um, actually made a huge difference. Um, we, we leveraged QB solve to, to essentially create our, our problem uh, um, the, the various different Monte Carlo trials that we, we'd run by, uh, where we'd have specific number of times the solutions would give these, these responses by, eventually leading to the, uh, the value of the cost function, basically the energy of the solution. Um, with that, we'd had to perform a couple, a lot of post-processing computing um, for the selected exchanges for the donor recipient pairs. And it's this, um, 
mapping of the selected exchanges that gets plotted into a solution, um, a, a solution which you would see up here. And it, it's, it feels like it's a very complex graph on here, but very clearly gets uh, selected into a nice neat exchange cycle. Um, that's it in as far as how we wound up solving this problem in a nutshell. Um, and so very quickly, I will take you through a quick demonstration and uh, walk you through exactly what we wound up doing in this scenario. And in, in order to do that very quickly, I'd, I'd like to walk you through, in, 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 in any sort of example, we'd like to walk through um, it as though it's a story, right? So let me start by introducing you to Sally. Sally over here, she needs a kidney and has registered for the USA National Donation Registry. But there are over 100,000 people in line. And, and by the way, some of these numbers are quite true even to today. So her chances of receiving a kidney this way is very low. So let me quickly introduce you, Frank. Sally and Frank are friends. And we know for a fact that Sally, and, and can, he's willing to donate his kidney over to Sally, which you know, any, many friends would be more than happy to do so. And in this situation over here, we try to determine the compatibility. And unfortunately, very quickly, we, we try to realize that the compatibility over here is make sure that it's, it's actually not a good uh, compatible option. Um, and so what do we wind up doing? We wind up introducing Mark. And in this scenario over here, Mark is another willing donor. Um, and also happens to be a great person, an example to, to be introduced into the exchange so they can actually go ahead and, uh, and get the necessary mapping. So now you have these four characters, um, Sally and Frank were not compatible, but in this situation, we know that there's another person, Alex, um, who Alex and Marco joined this exchange that can be and that do have the satisfied uh, needs for both the pairs. I just walked you through very, very quickly what it looks like for these, this four person set. Now we talked about it and we, you know, we knew, we knew exactly what the different mappings are based off the, 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 the various different uh, edges that we just described on the previous page. That's just an example. Now let's get everybody into this exchange and, and, and try to walk you through exactly what actually happens over here. Um, in, in this situation over here, I'm showing you an example of what it looks like for Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Kidney Expo. And, and we know for a fact that, you know, the overall, the initial network size is, you know, 30 different people in here. And so you have uh, well over 91 connections. Now, off of these 91 connections, we know for a fact that we, have, you know, we have roughly about 23 different connections, uh, priority connections with it. Some are of low priority, some are of high priority, which is determined, again, by some of the, the edge scoring rubrics, whether it's a zero mismatch, et cetera, and so on. Now, now that you have that, you get to see exactly you know, which person over here is going to be a well-suited match um, within the state. So obviously, things like even distances, et cetera, is also a considering factor over here. This way, you have an idea of what actually happens. This is interesting. Now, what's, what's pretty cool about this stuff is we quickly ran this problem into uh, you know, D-Wave's uh, 2000 Q machine, and we computed the, the optimal network of these kidney exchanges. And we realized that the maximum number of Nebraskans in Enable were, were, was basically, uh, which was reached at this point in time. So we, once we ran through the optimization problem, we quickly found that there's a handful of selected um, maps that we could essentially have over here to perform this exchange. Now, if I were um, a physician or a doctor who's in the operating table and I have this you know, in front of me, it, it makes my life slightly easier to decide exactly where to get these uh, mappings formula or brought in. What's, what's interesting now is, well, we want to make this thing national. Once we bring this out nationally, you, you've very quickly gotten a scale problem that's rather large. Now, this is not to say that it can't be solved. It definitely can be solved, definitely with, with some of the, you know, the newer architectures that we can, we, we can bake in and you should be expecting from uh, some D-Wave as well. And just so you have an idea, this is a quick simulation of how this network could be solved from a national scale. Um, as, as I might have mentioned before, a lot of these problems were, were run in the D-Wave machine behind the scenes. So we, we ran roughly about, um, 
uh, 30 Monte Carlo, oh, 30 different Monte Carlo uh, simulation trials um, over, over well over a number of connections that you see over here in order to actually generate and drive this graph up. Um, so the, this image that you see down here in the bottom is, is of not of a, a such of a complex problem as this one is, because if it were, all you would see is a big black ball of, of the various different uh, node and edge connections. So that's very quickly what just walking you through this demo. Um, now, we, we know for a fact that this, this is going to propose quite a bit of challenges and we know to you know, further innovate and scale more in this area. So if I were to kind of innovate and scale more, you know, what were some of the things that we're currently working on? Uh, what were the things that we've understood to be challenges to, to further um, this, this program, right? So obviously when we want to scale further, we want to continue research into this area more to kind of improve this pre-existing algorithm that we built out. Um, and since our solution was limited to small network sizes, we want to kind of expand this further. So, you know, talking to hospital management and beyond was one such idea. Um, we, we do have several ideas. Obviously, it can't be all fit on one page. Uh, improving the process by which we, behind the scenes, how you actually do the mapping. Um, within the United States, it, it's, a very, um, it's a very just system, a very uh, equal system where no one is uh, given priority over the other. So understanding how these governments and organizations improve processes to this map is, is very important, which makes uh, optimization a little bit more um, realistic for some of the government organizations to, uh, to proceed forward. The implementation that we have here from a custom enablement standpoint is obviously a very quick demo of the app, right? So this further improvements could definitely be made to this one. Um, while we built from a data set perspective, while we ran multiple different simulations and randomly generated data sets, uh, building a connection directly to the broadest data sets available via UNOS uh, for the patient, um, for, for, for the pairs of patient donor mappings, which is well over 75,000 right now, uh, could be uh, leveraged and, and used to expand further. And obviously one of the other things that we want to do as Mark or I'll mention before, is to, to expand this further into different hardwares. So the same problem was also thought to build into the gate model as well as, um, um, as what we wanted to intend to do as well. Now, I realize that I'm, I'm about five minutes short of the 30 minute marker over here. So um, with that said, should we move on to the Q&A section? Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hey, hey hi. Hey, Jen. It's Jen Houston. Uh, so, um, Mark and Trist, thank you for giving us that really quick overview, but, you know, sort of informative conversation about how do we do really important global things with quantum computers. And I really want to commend Accenture for not only using technology for good, but also for, you know, jumping in and really thinking about what are the problems that that these quantum systems can really help solve. And I noticed that we have some questions that have come in online. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna sort of just go through sort of a round table Q&A with Mark and, and um, with Shreyas, asking some questions, bantering, probably answering some questions that people online have had for a while. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll make sure at the end, we have about 10 minutes to make sure that we're answering the questions that have come in directly from you, the audience. So if you do have a question, please post it on the Q&A. And we've got a team of people that are either gonna be answering it online or we'll see if we can, you know, if it has enough, has enough uh, of interest uh, from the community, we'll, we'll answer it live uh, while Mark and Shreyas answer it. So with that, I was gonna say, you know, Wow, I mean, kidney exchanges. What a what a really important, you know, and valuable, you know, actual practical application of using a quantum computer. I guess my question for you, and I'm going to start with you, Mark, first, is how did you get involved personally? Like quantum computing, this feels is like this very big abstract thing. How did you get involved in quantum computing? I mean, and how do you find yourself here today talking about, you know, kidney exchanges and and using quantum computers to to help solve that those problems? That's a great question, Jen. Thanks for asking. Well, I have to say that uh, I have probably the best job in this uh, company it's called Accenture. You know, it's a, it's a company uh, which is about 500,000 employees and I run R&D globally for this company, which I think is really the different, the best gig you can get. 
And so um, as part of my job is really to scout off all the research that we see, because we work a lot with partners like you guys, but with also universities, luminaries and everything. And so we're always looking at what is the next waves of technology or the combinatorial effect of waves and how we're gonna be able to leverage it against to provide um, applied solution for our clients. And so um, two years ago, we were discussing with Paul Doherty, our CTO, who I think met uh, with you guys at the time. And I think one thing that we found together was staggering for us is that, yes, finally, uh, we're building computers that are accessible and, and we can access those machines from wherever you are. And with abstraction layer, we can build like through one QB to other like QC where uh, QX branch and everything. We can really build like a project and programs to really use and harness to, to this power. And so that's where we started to, uh, to think about what we could do. And I think the, uh, the strength of Accenture is really to map industry problems to this kind of technology. And that's exactly what we did. So exciting time, as you said. Thank you, Mark. I'm, I'm so glad you're part of this industry. Um, so Shreya, same question. How did you find yourself uh, on your journey to quantum computing? Oh boy, um, I could always start way back when I was a little child. <laughs> but, um, quite, quite honestly, what, everything about this from a scientific standpoint fascinated me. Beyond the scientific standpoint, it, the simplicity of actually me being able to get into it kind of got me to, to learn and uh, get it applied into businesses directly. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, my, my learning curve over here was, was, was something of quite a bit of a sharp curve that you had to have very quickly and get smart and, and, and start developing. So for me personally, it was um, just being enticed with something that is science fiction and, and, and doing it in real life just got me interested more and more. So it seems like one of the themes I'm hearing between the presentation you give and just listening to both of you is that, you know, taking this really scientific and abstract thing and making it really practical and usable is where your passion lies. So I'm going to ask the question, so why do we think quantum computing all of a sudden is such a hot topic? Uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to answer that first. Sure. So I think the reason why it's definitely a hot topic is because, first of all, I mean, there's been a a lot of research, I mean, for the last 15, 20 years on this, uh, on this technology. It's just the fact that today, as I said, is that we're back to the mainframe time. Instead, this time is not mainframe, it's like a quantum computer. You remember the time we had mainframes, people could connect, that the slot of the machine, and then they can basically run their little COBOL programs in it. Well, we're back to that, but we're doing that with quantum computing today. Those machines are accessible through a VPN connection or whatever. And then again, through um, those software SDK and abstraction layer that is getting built, people can really program them using Pythons and everything. So they don't need to be mathematicians, really. They need to work with mathematicians. But I think what we need from them is that they need to come up with ideas, these kidney exchange ideas, or the uh, risk management idea for a portfolio from financial services. Come up with the idea Pair that with good mathematicians that can model the stuff and use the particular machine that is accessible today. That's how you do that. So what I'm hearing you say is that for you, it's that the, the companies have matured to the point where there are the tools, there oh, yeah. are the systems, the hardware, so it can be real today. Trace, anything, any, any thoughts from your side on why you think it's a hot topic today? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, it's, it's kind of resulting the same stuff, right? Um, there are so many recent developments. Developments like like the ones that you guys just announced recently. That's that's making this thing a little bit more exciting. Um, you, uh, we've seen enterprises begin their journeys. Um, enterprises uh, they, that they actually want to start working in the new and, and, and developing something great and awesome, uh, and and not wanting to be um, a name in history that didn't experiment sooner, right? Um, and and as, as Mark mentioned, we've, and we've surveyed several businesses, so the various different tech visions that he's had uh, that, that, that Mark sends out and you know, everybody reads and we, we, we send out these surveys. We've seen enterprises already taking proactive steps. Um, and, and, and then many of the people over here are already planning to invest in quantum capabilities in the next couple of years anyway. So for, for us, this is definitely a very, very hot topic. Well, I would say then that leads me to the next question, which is everyone always asks me this every time I talk to them. What's the time frame from, for quantum computing? Is it 20 years away? Is it five years away? Is it, is it here now? Where, how does Accenture think about that? I, I'd say it's today. I mean, it's like, look at what we're doing. I mean, obviously, I mean, some of the problem, we cannot solve them yet on the hardware, but we can simulate them. And the hardware is going very fast. You know, I mean, the quantum technology is following the Moore's law. So you guys are going to make some announcements soon where eventually we're going to be able to 
uh, process again, basically our kidney problem to something bigger. So I think the time is now, and I would say that if you look at adi adiabatic computers and everything, probably we're talking about something that could be really in production in the two to five years time. If you look at the Gates model, it's probably something that's gonna be further down the road, something probably around like five to 10 years. But I mean, what is five to 10 years? What is two to five years? I say it's tomorrow, it's tomorrow. That's great, thank you. So, okay, so then the other question I get all the time is, okay, what's the best use for a quantum computer? Like, what are the applications? What are the, um, what are the, the channels? What are, you know, what are the, what are the, what industries are gonna benefit from it? Uh, Shreyas, you wanna, wanna jump in on that? Yeah, sure. So at this point in time, quantum computing is best suited for solving problems using three types of algorithms, right? You, you've always heard this. You've heard me talk about optimization. You've heard me talk about sampling and machine learning separately in different topics. Um, currently, the primary areas of focus is over here for us, at least right now, is optimization, which is the goal to find the best decision about many of the problems you have. So, you know, it's in, in, in a real-world situation, examples of this one would be like cost-effective routes for shipping goods or determining the most efficient way to extract resources from a mine, or seeking productive resources allocated involved in a production mine, or, or looking for other innovative pharmaceutical uh, drug discovery methods, or, you know, a, a, a better way to manage risk in financial portfolios. I mean, there's just multiple different options. Uh, you know, whereas the processing time required by these classical computers to provide these solutions for these problems can be exponentially the size of the problem itself, Quantum computing will provide a much more speedier answer. This is, is what we're kind of pinching on right now. Mark, anything to add to that? No, I think um, Shiraz covered it very well. I mean, it's like I mentioned that we have 42 or 45 industries that we cover across five industry groups. And so 150 use cases. I mean, we're fine in financial services. So I was mentioning about portfolio risk optimization. Also with fraud detection, and I think yeah, Shari was talking about putting foldings, drug discovery, but there's also in manufacturing, you know, the whole supply chain, the purchasing, there's a lot of optimization we can do there. Uh, media and technology as well. I mean, how are we gonna advertise? How are we gonna recommend things and stuff like that? Uh, what we learn from preferences and how we can optimize, do the matchmaking better, instead of sending you a kidney, basically sending you something else and everything. Well, that's, that's also what quantum can, can help to solve. Definitely. That's great. So, okay, then the next question is, because that was, that's the, those are the opportunities, but what are the challenges to quantum? Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about the challenges to quantum today? Sure. I, I think the first thing is that I would say is that there's definitely an education challenge. Okay, so I think people need to um, get educated about what to do with quantum computing today, uh, understanding the time frame as we just discussed that, what's possible today and what is not possible. Uh, I think that's one of the challenges. I think the second challenge is just is really to understand exactly, yeah, how are we going to apply that? And there's like really specific areas where we can apply it today. And tomorrow there will be much more probably when we move to Gates and something will, will be able to cover much more than just optimization or sampling or machine learning. Uh, but I think that's, and I think the third one is going to be probably the access to the machine. Okay, so there's like machines uh, today and we don't have enough access to all those different machines, but that's okay because they're simulators. So we can get trained using simulators until basically all those machines have uh, a wider um, uh, availability and people are gonna be able to use them. But I think education is probably the number one for me. So I'm hearing you say education, getting people educated, making sure that people understand how to get started. Um, yep. I'm hearing you say um, that there is a, a, a access so the sort yeah. of the democratization of quantum computing and, and the ability to actually access things live. So, so you know, I, I, Century talks to a lot. You, you are a huge organization. I think, Trish, you told me you're like 850,000 people around the world. I may be wrong <laughs> on that. But it's a lot of people. And you talk to business people every single day. How are you helping them get started in quantum computing? So for, from my standpoint over here, we have, you know, you can combine this thing from a short-term perspective and a long-term perspective. Right. Very short term, as Mark and you guys already alluded to, begin learning about this. And, and there, there are various tools. Learn about the tools. Learn about quantum computing. Then you identify these areas where the business is today. Quantum computing can actually make a difference. Once you get an idea of what some of those business problems are, test it. Test these use cases. You're not going to get it right the first time around, but just test it and learn how you can, you can make that better. Once you've gotten some of these, like, you know, when, when I'm in the test, like you create a quick proof of concept or, or, or a quick pilot, create a timeline from that on, on how these use cases will then later scale. And, and obviously, from, if you're a large business, from, from a long-term perspective, it's also what you're thinking. Create 
yourself a, a, a quantum computing roadmap specific for the businesses that you have that, will, that you, know, you kind of use to kind of reevaluate every single year. Appoint a group of employees to monitor these trends. Um, you know, build whatever applications you want to have off, off of, uh, of what you have from a business standpoint. So, I mean, he, here is how I would start it off, right? Well, those two short terms and, and, and long term approaches. Great, great. So, I keep hearing education, that's a key theme. Get started, start learning. A second thing I keep hearing, and I think it's really important, is identify the right problems, um, yep. the problems that you found. You haven't been able to get to the solutions uh, as, easy, as easily or, or there is something, whether it be the complexity of the problem or the scope and scale of the problem. Um, so I think what people on the online probably really want to know is, okay, so you're telling me to get started. How do I get started? So Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, if you're a business, and I think there's probably multiple people online. So there's both people who are thinking through the lens of business, and there's probably some developers online as well. So could you give some advice on what those things, tangible things they could do to get started? Yeah, I think from a, from a, if you're more a business person, like you need to understand exactly what the capabilities of this kid, of those uh, of those technology of this quantum computer can do. And there's like really good books you can find. You can start reading and understand. And of course, and you can go on the web. And as Charles was mentioning, it's like a lot of things that we can learn from it. I think what's going to be more important is that to try to quantify or identify the the the, the use case you're going to be able to leverage. And I think the second thing is going to be probably you know, it's a very collaborative thinking. Um, it's not like you show my stack, you know? I mean, there's gonna be people that more on the hardware. They're gonna be people that mathematicians that will have basically to model your problems. They're gonna have more industrial or like industry focused people and everything. So I think you need to um, put around you basically a, a collaborative team that's gonna be tackling all those different uh, use cases. I think from a more a developer standpoint, um, obviously, um, you need to um, have access, and, and I think, I mean, if you look at many uh, hardware vendor like you guys, I mean, the, the, the fantastic things about it is that you're, you deliver access pretty easily, I mean, at least to a simulator, to an SDK, so that people can learn from it. And then, as I said again, I mean, there's all the capability that you're going to have to be able to program in C. If you know Python, that's good. You can program in Python. And then, if you don't know graph representation and you know, all this mathematical theory and everything, that's that's fine because you guys have been able to build basically APIs on top of that that can be leveraged and give also very good example to use cases on when to use them or not based on some classification of problems. So I think they should get started with this and then and play, play, have fun. <laughs> that's right. We said one of our goals was to have fun, so I think yeah, that's, that's really important, fun. right? So um, I think so just to wrap up and then I'm going to open it up for some of the questions of the audience. A couple things that I heard um, there are there's a lot of, you know, ex there's a lot of exploration going on today and smart businesses are looking at the problem sets and the classification of the problems that they need to solve and, and looking at how quantum can play a role in that. That's one of the things. Second thing I heard is education, get started today. There's a lot to learn. It's a totally different sort of mindset. Um, it's not traditional coding. It's, it's thinking very differently. Um, uh, third thing I heard that I think is really important is collaboration. We even at D-Wave have physicists sitting next to mathematicians, sitting next to computer scientists. Um, so finding that collaborative team, I think, is I've heard is pretty important. And fourth I heard is, listen, get started. And there are industries across the board from manufacturing to mining to uh, financial services and you know and and healthcare, uh, it, all all are exploring quantum today. So so thank you to both of you. Um, we're going to open it up, Susan. I'm going to hand it over to you for some of the direct questions from the audience. Okay, thanks very much. So we've had a lot of questions coming in. Uh, many of them have been answered, and many of them are still open. Uh, we only have time to get to a few of them. Um, one question is: Is it possible to know the size of the database of donors receivers you used for the simulations? Um, good, good question. So I, I would rather look at it over here in the sense that what we were not tapping into the database, we were actually winding up creating ourselves um, in, in real time, a set of random uh, components and connections and patient donors uh, mapping capabilities based on the various different, uh, you know, edge criteria. Uh, the actual database itself is something that can be requested via ONOS. Um, UNOS is a, an organization that kind of pulls a lot of these data sets behind the scenes and um, you, you, you basically you have to go through a request process and, and get it 
get it sent over to you and then you wind up using it. To my knowledge, that request with the patient donors that we've been requested at least was well, you know, somewhere in the you know, 75 or 100,000 different patient donor mappings in there baked into it already. Um, the actual size of it from a gigabyte standpoint, et cetera, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as thinking that it's, it's an entire data center worth of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of, of resources, but again, don't, don't quote me on that. Okay, and actually we have a question related to that. Uh, having been through this process in person, I'm a recipient, different organ, the speed of convergence in each twice daily network wide run was an issue. What's the quantum advantage to using a QPU here to optimize the network versus the, versus the traditional runs we use at UNOS now? The a lot of the traditional runs over here, we're talking about more from a speed standpoint. What we need to kind of prove out is getting that larger data sets and running it against it so we can provide you that exact response that you're asking for. The, the idea over here, the, the benefit that you're going to see over here is what is being hypothesized, which is that you are going to see that immediate improvements. The immediate improvements over here were, were noticed. I, I think Casey might have actually answered that question on another related question as well. So it's, the idea is that it, you do see that improvement here. And obviously, as I mentioned, as, as Mark mentioned before, getting to experiment with this stuff right away, getting yourself in to, to get started and thinking about how this is going to work out better. Okay, next question. Uh, do you know of any applications of quantum computing in financial investment, stock, and cryptocurrencies trading or wealth? Are there open source projects? Um, we have th the, qu the short answer to that one is Accenture has thought about a lot of these use cases uh, for those exact same different components. Now, I'm not sure from a cryptographic standpoint that we've built a solution on that yet. Um, however, from a financial uh, services standpoint, definitely uh, leveraging uh, any, anything to do with risk analysis, arbitrage-based uh, computational analysis, um, stock market analysis in, in, in somewhat of a quasi-real-time state, um, along with um, uh, correlation and causality analysis as well. The, these are considerations, and, and some of these things do have baked out uh, use cases. I don't know if we have time to talk about that in detail, but whoever that is that has asked the question, feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to answer it. Yeah, and I would just I would just add that on the if you log into Leap, there's op, there's a ton of examples, and there's a community that's increasingly open sourcing their code. There's Jupyter Notebooks, so there's some there's some samples there. And then I can tell you from D-Wave's perspective, there we're working with a lot of really interesting. Um, entrepreneurs who are solving these problems using quantum computers. So it's, there's definitely a, 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 a real push in the financial services space right now. Okay. Yeah, and to, yeah. to, to add to what Jen and Shreya said, I mean, I would add just the fact that we are in flight, several projects and pilots that we're doing with clients. Uh, because of confidentiality, we cannot share much about this, but uh, you can be sure that when it's going to be possible, we'll, we'll talk about it in the market. Uh, recently, we talked about the work we are doing with Biogen on drug discovery, something running on Great. the G wave. Uh, this is coming, so there's a lot of work happening right now. Yeah, and I, wanna, I don't want to lose the point that there's going to be some things that are not going to be open source, but we believe that the entire community will all boats rise when we are sharing our early. You know, there will be IP reasons not to you know to do that, but but Leap is set up right now that if you open, you know, if you assign your GitHub account, you get a free minute every month that allows you to actually go in and not only use the QPU real access to it, but also have access to the community and the, the notebooks and the, you know, the samples that are really gonna drive this exploration that, that both Treas and Mark have, have talked about today. Okay, I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, a few people asked whether we can provide a notebook for the demo. We're putting them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how proprietary your code is. Um, I'll look to both of you on to answer that one. Not at the minute. Um, the short answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, so there are a number of optimization problems but, with code on but, the existing uh, site yeah. today. But 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 I I will say that I guess what once a couple of things get materialized behind the scenes, sharing it shouldn't uh, necessarily be the problem at that point in time. Thanks, Tris. Okay, and we will end with an, a nice aspirational question here. What could be a different, different, 
difficult problem that could be solved on a quantum computer and may deserve a Nobel Prize? It's <laughs> a good one. Um, I, think, I think there's going to be, I would say it's like right now, I mean, obviously there's a lot of discussion related to climate change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if we can, if we can build a, a, mo a model that could be supported by some quantum computing technology and everything, and then we can progress into this, I think that could be something very interesting for for human being, definitely. I agree. Okay. Well, we will attempt uh, after this is over to answer some of the other questions that we have online that we don't have time for now. Again, my apologies for the late start, but we're glad you were all able to join us. Uh, we will be posting uh, this recording uh, to YouTube over the next few days on the D-Wave channel. So thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you at a future webinar. And thanks, Mark and Treas. We appreciate you being here. Thanks thank to you. everyone who joined us. Bye. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.